All right, let's begin. Hello, and welcome to this edition of our global webinar series. Today's topic is all about decoupling and filtering. My name is Wilmer Compagnoni, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We're very pleased to, that you found the time to join today's webinar, and today's presenter is Olivia Williams, and she'll be covering decoupling and filtering. So with that, I'll hand it off to Olivia, uh, one of our FAEs out in the West Coast, and she'll get started. So thank you, Olivia, and as you wish. All right. Thank you, Wilmer. Um, so like Wilmer already noted, I'm Olivia Williams. I'm one of the field application engineers out here. I'm located in the Bay Area in California. Um, I graduated with a bachelor's in electrical engineering from the University of Mississippi and have been working at Kemet as an FAE now for about two years. So uh, like Wilmer already mentioned, today we're gonna be talking about um, decoupling and filtering. So first off, we're gonna start with the fundamentals. And so first we need to differentiate our topics a little bit, uh, decoupling and filtering. So sometimes they're thought of as the same thing, but can actually have quite different purposes. Uh, for example, decoupling is when something is given up, whereas filtering is passing something along. So to illustrate this, let's look at a microprocessor block diagram. So we've got our four main stages, the DC input, which is your power rail, uh, the DC to DC conversion, where we step down that input voltage, uh, then our voltage regulator, and then finally our IC. Um, between all these, we've got both decoupling and filtering going on. Um, moving towards the IC providing clean power or moving away along a return path. And um, all throughout, we're going to be using both these decoupling and filtering capacitors to both absorb and deliver charge. Um, whether it's a lower frequency situation, which tends to require higher capacitance values, um, so larger capacitors, or a higher frequency, which tends to need lower capacitance values or smaller capacitors. Um, so those are kind of two main things we're gonna keep in mind as we go throughout this presentation. So let's first take a closer look at decoupling. Um, so one of the most prevalent uses of capacitors in low voltage DC design is to decouple an IC from the power supply circuitry. Uh, so basically the IC can use this set of capacitors and bypass the power supply if needed. So this is kind of where they get their other name from, which is bypass capacitor. Uh, they can effectively act like uh, like a local reservoir of energy uh, or help maintain to help maintain stable voltage levels and supply fast power in the case there's any kind of voltage droop like if uh, multiple devices all would demand power at the same time um, they can also help protect the IC from any high frequency noise on the bus or decouple um, any RC relays that can also lead to lowering the overall bus levels so it's in these ways um, eliminating high frequency noise decoupling RC delay, delays and preventing voltage droops that bypass capacitors, um, eliminate delays in supplying the power, which is a critical issue with high performance embedded devices today, where we need to ensure that regulated voltages um, stay within our bounds and keep them within like our increasingly tight tolerances. Um, so first, a uh, very important factor is the impedance. So why is the impedance important? Uh, well, we need our impedance to be on the same level or lower than whatever the impedance of the target IC is so that our PDN can be decoupled efficiently. So first we need to calculate our target impedance, which can be done by just applying another variation of Ohm's law, where we take Z target, equals the voltage rail times whatever the percent ripple is over 100 divided by the maximum transient current. And we'll take that, we transform it into the time domain, integrate it, then um, subtract out the step response from the VRM, and that'll give us our target impedance that we need to try to be matching with our decoupling capacitors. 
Um, so let's start off by looking at an example. Uh, so here we're going to be trying to work down our system to the calculated impedance. Uh, so back in the early days of the PDN design, it was kind of the thing to do just to put like a number of 0.1 microfarads close to the active device's leads. And this approach was sufficient so long as the active devices did not generate too much transient noise above the series resonance frequency of the capacitor. Um, but just, oh, I'm sorry, just notice that these um, animations are a little bit off. So I apologize, let me fix this. Okay. It was kind of the thing to do just to take like a 0.1 microfarad capacitor and just put a bunch of them in parallel to try to get the impedance down to whatever your target is. So let's see how that kind of used to work. Um, so here we're gonna start with, um, with a capacitor and we're just going to start adding a bunch in parallel, which we call cascading. So our target impedance here is the 100 milliohms and we can see that our series resonance frequency is about 6.5 megahertz. So as we add more capacitors, uh, we can see our impedance comes down a little bit to 4.8 milliohms, and we can see that our SRF doesn't change at all. Um, and then we can add even more, and it came down a little bit more. Um, and again, the series resonance frequency hasn't changed either. Um, but this can be a little bit inefficient, just continually adding more and more in parallel of the same value, especially since we noted in the beginning that when you have lower frequency targets, you tend to use higher cap values, or if you have a higher frequency target, you need to use lower cap values. So today we tried to design our um, decoupling network a little bit more strategically than just cascading a bunch of capacitors in parallel, but we can see a benefit here by putting in parallel, which is that the SRF doesn't change if they're all identical. Um, so let's look at an example where we're gonna try to be more strategic. Uh, so our target impedance is 100 milliohms, and uh, we're gonna have a lower frequency bound of 10 kilohertz and an upper bound of about 500 megahertz. So first here we've started off which is a uh, tantalum polymer capacitor. They tend to be very high capacitance. Uh, we see this one's 330 microfarads. So with that high capacitance and our target being 100 milliohms, we can probably guess that our lower bound is gonna be okay. And we see there that it is. Um, our target impedance here is this heavy yellow line. Uh, or sorry, the target is the green line and the impedance that we have of our decoupling network is this heavy yellow line. So the lower bound is fine, but it's the upper range that we need to worry about. The impedance there is still way over what our target is. So what can we do? It's higher frequency. So we probably don't wanna add another huge cat value. So what we'll do is add a lower capacitance. And here we can see the result of that. So we're gonna look at the combined impedance, which is this heavy gray line and we've added a one microfarad ceramic capacitor. Uh, everything here is 10 volts. But we can see that, well, we can see first that it did bring our impedance down at the higher range, but at the higher end. But we have this pop up here, this point called the anti-resonant point. And these can become a little bit problematic because you can see that it's higher than the um, impedance of both the uh, tantalum and the ceramic. So we need to keep an eye on that. And we can see that it usually comes up right where those impedances cross over. So this is something that we need to be wary of as we go throughout our design. Um, make sure we keep that point also within our 100 milliohm level. So we're still high on impedance at the upper band, the 500 megahertz. Um, the inner resonant point is a little bit high, but let's see what we can do about that. So here we've added another of the one microfarad ceramic capacitor. And we can see that um, our anti-resonant point came down just a little bit. 
also the impedance at the higher frequency end has come down a little bit more. Uh, and then our lower band hasn't really been affected much at all since um, these are such small capacitance values. But we're still not at our target across our entire um, band from 10 kilohertz to 500 megahertz. So we need to bring that upper band down even further. And what we've done is we've added yet a smaller capacitance value, a 10 nanofarad. Uh, and we see that it did bring it down. We're getting closer to our 100 milliohm target at the upper frequency range. Uh, we have another anti-resonant point cropping up here. That's because we've added another cap value. Um, they're all still in parallel, but the capacitance values have changed. So we have another anti-resonant point that we need to be keeping an eye on over here. And so to bring the upper band down even further, the, or the impedance at our upper band, um, which is our goal, we've added uh, even more of the 10 nanofarads. We've added six, and we see that it brought it down pretty drastically. But in turn, it also raised one of our anti-resonant points. So now this has become a problem. So since that anti-resonant point is at a little bit lower frequency, we're gonna add a little bit higher value capacitor. And so we've added a 47 nanofarad and we can see that this has effectively brought down the anti-resonant point back down to our 100 milliohm target. Um, it still hasn't really drastically affected our lower bound, the impedance there, we're still within 100 milliohms. Um, but we still need to keep in mind like the combined impact of everything that we've added here. Right now, it's not having any effect uh, on the lower band. And up on the upper band, we're even closer to our 100 milliohm target. Again, our combined impedance is this heavy gray line. Okay. So, um, now we've added more of these 47 nanos. We've got this upper bound almost right at 100 milliohms. All of our um, anti-resonant points are still under our 100 milliohm target and our lower end hasn't been affected too much either. So we're moving in the right direction. We're almost done. Um, so to try to pull that down even further at the upper bound, the 500 megahertz, since it's much higher frequency, we added a smaller cap value, 4.7 nanofarad, and look what we've done. Well, now the combined um, capacitance of all of these smaller cap values has actually had a little bit of an impact on our lower bound. So we can see here at the 10 kilohertz, our combined impedance is over um, our 100 milliohm target. Also, our anti-resonant points have cropped back up. So we can see this whole process has been just kind of playing around, trying to uh, facilitate both the lower frequency bands and the higher frequency bands. It's been kind of give and take. But so let's just think, what can we do now to fix this entire range? So since we got to fix the lower band and still bring down the upper just a little bit more and also bring those uh, anti-resonant points back within bound, we've added six more of the 4.7 nanofarads, which has effectively brought the impedance down at all of our target frequencies. Our lower range, which is the 10 kilohertz, all the way up to the about 500 megahertz. And also our anti-resonant points are down below our 100 milliohm target as well. So the combined capacitance that we've actually used here uh, is 331 microfarads. Um, and I also should note the bias voltage, which this is pretty important when you're designing with ceramic capacitors. Uh, class one's not really, class twos and threes, it can have a big impact. So this bias voltage, it could just, it's just whatever the voltage would be on your IC here, I've arbitrarily chosen one volt. Um, but like with the ceramic capacitors, when you're designing uh, your decoupling bank with them, if you're using class twos or class threes, they have what's called um, a DC bias effect, which is the more DC voltage that you put on the capacitor, the lower the capacitance 
is. So you might start out with say like a one microfarad, say an X7R or an X6S, these are both class two capacitors. And you can say you have, it's a 16 volt rated part, but once you put like 14 volts on it or 10 volts on it, you're no longer gonna have uh, the one microfarad, you're gonna have less than that. Um, so always set your bias voltage when you're uh, designing your capacitor bank if you're using any uh, class two or class three ceramics. Um, but that's about it. Uh, so we can see the process that we took when we were targeting the lower frequency range, we used larger capacitance values. Um, targeting the higher frequency band, we used the smaller ones. Uh, these are just kind of the general rules of thumb. Uh, so. so this is just kind of to give a big picture overview before we look at the tool we used and then move on to filtering. So again, our goal here is to match the impedance of the target processor and decouple our power distribution network. So what we did, uh, we took the 330 microfarad, which is the tantalum polymer capacitor. They tend to be much more um, capacitance dense than the ceramics, uh, which took care of our lower bound easily, but then we had issues with the upper bound, uh, the, the higher frequency. So we gradually worked it down with lower capacitance values, which we used ceramics for. Um, so before moving on to the filtering, I just wanna show you guys the tool that I used to go through this example, this demonstration. Uh, so this is Kemet's capacitor simulation tool. Um, it's called KSIM. You can access it by following that link or you can find it on our website. Under Engineering Center, you go to Design Tools. It's the first one that'll be listed. Um, so with KSM, you can select your capacitors. If you, if you know your part number already, you can just paste it in there and it'll pull it up. Or you can um, kind of build your capacitor. You can start by the dielectric type. We used a lot of ceramics. Uh, this, whichever series you're using, pick your case size, your dielectric type. Uh, your voltage rating, and then whatever's available for all those combinations will show up here. Uh, you just click whichever you want, and it'll add it to the chart. Um, so here we mostly just use the impedance and ESR uh, chart, but there's several, several things that you can look at in case um, uh, for your capacitor design. Um, but right now, just looking at the impedance and ESR. So you can add multiple parts to um, the graph, just like we did. Uh, throughout our example. So you can change the quantity here below the graph. Uh, like we mentioned, you can set your bias voltage. Uh, you can change your ambient temperature, all these different things. But just be sure that if you're wanting to look at your combined impedance at the top, you just have to select combined, you do yes, and it shows you um, combined impedance and ESR of all the capacitors that you've selected together for the graph, which comes out to your heavy. So it's a very, very handy tool. Um, we are undergoing a project to add even uh, more capacitors to be available to model. right now. We have a pretty, pretty large selection, um, but if you're using this tool one day and you don't see like a cap that's in there that you need, you can just reach out to us and we can see about um, helping you out as far as getting the data for you. Uh, but again, excellent tool. A lot of our engineers uh, make great use of it. Uh, so again, before we move on, just a quick real world, real world example of a PDN um, designed by Larry Mosley of Intel. And this is just to sort of demonstrate as we move closer to the target, um, as the frequency increases, kind of like what capacitors uh, we tend to use. So here at the lower frequency range, um, these demand like higher cap values which are gonna be things maybe like polymers, aluminum polymers, tantalum polymers, uh, film capacitors if you're over 40 volts, or even ceramic capacitors. But as you move closer and closer to the load and your frequency increases more and more, you need better, um, you need better things like, or better frequency response, you need lower ESL, lower ESR, uh, lower cap values as the frequency increases as we saw. And those are generally gonna to tend to be ceramic capacitors as we keep in mind our impedance target. So um, let's look at filtering. 
So a couple different uses of it, um, the block, um, blocking your unwanted signals or also passing along your wanted signals, which would be like a low pass filter. Uh, so we're gonna start again by looking at an example. Uh, here we have a nicely simplified DC to DC converter. And on the output, uh, we have our C out also uh, inductors are used on the output, which we haven't talked about too much yet, um, but we're gonna touch on them here in just a minute. So on the output, uh, ESL is, ESR, ESL is pretty critical and for efficiency. Um, but here, let's just look at some of the key benefits to the different capacitor types. Because it might be confusing when you start, um, when you start your design for your filter caps and you might go to your supplier's web page and you might just put in their search bar like the capacitance that you need and the voltage that you need but it brings up so many options because um, there's very many dielectric types you have your ceramics and your tantalums and your films and it can be a lot to sort through so let's just take a moment and look at the benefits to each of them so ceramic capacitors um, a go-to for a lot of different applications they're pretty good from like middle range to high frequency, they're probably the best performers at higher frequency. Um, just they have lower ESL, just much better frequency response. Uh, pretty dynamic voltage range. So um, just from, I guess, any range that you might use for a DC to DC converter, like ceramics can go all the way up to thousands of volts, all the way down to like low, low voltage. So they're pretty good all around. But um, a couple differences between them, kind of like I noted briefly, um, back when we were looking at the decoupling caps. So you have the class ones and the class twos. So if you have an application where you need like a very, very, very stable uh, capacitance uh, with frequency and temperature, things like that, you're gonna wanna stick with the class ones, which are like your C0G capacitors, a U2J capacitor, you might know it as MPO. They don't have any of the DC bias um, like a class two would. Uh, they don't have any temperature dependence. So these are like the most stable, but the drawback is that you get lower capacitance out of the capacitor. So if you need like a higher, higher cap value, you might have to use a bunch of them in parallel to get up to it. Um, but for very high frequencies, usually you don't need that great capacitance. So they could be a good go-to for you there. Uh, the film capacitors, uh, mid-frequency range, they're pretty good. Higher frequency response, once you get on up there, like with like 500 megahertz, I mean, you're gonna have some issues with like dissipation factors. They just don't perform very well uh, for very high frequencies, just due to some of the nuances of the film materials. Uh, but they are great for higher voltage. Uh, lower voltage is not very ideal. Um, also, aluminum electrolytics have been used frequently, frequently in the past. But as uh, frequency requirements are becoming higher and higher, you might see them being used a little bit less. Uh, they also tend to have higher ESR than what you would see in like a ceramic or a polymer. So we saw already that ESR and impedance is a critical um, factor when designing this. So aluminum electrolytic might not be what you want to start with, but if you need like a very cost effective design, um, they are pretty robust and could perform well enough for you. Um, then we're going to look, we also have the aluminum V-chip polymers. Uh, it's still an aluminum capacitor, but it has a polymer electrode instead. Uh, so it makes them a little bit better at higher frequencies. Um, due to, oh, so like the aluminum capacitors, they don't perform well at the higher frequency due to like what's called a uh, capacitance roll off. So like the higher the frequency goes, you lose capacitance. Um, the aluminum polymers don't have as big an issue as that. You'll still see it some, but it's not as much as you would get out of the aluminum electrolytic. Also, the ESR is a good bit lower um, and they perform pretty well throughout a dynamic voltage range. And then we have polymer there. We just mean our tantalum polymer. Uh, pretty good for your just general mid-range frequencies. Uh, pretty decent voltage range. Uh, less than 40 volts, definitely. Uh, then this was kind of like our predecessor to the MNO2. So you might be familiar with the tantalum MNO2s. So they're usually like the little yellow capacitors if you use tantalum. They tend to have higher ESR than the tantalum polymers. Um, they also have a little bit worse voltage performance. Just, and that's just mostly due to our uh, derating guidelines. So for the tantalum MNO2, uh, we highly recommend doing 50% voltage derating. This is just for reliability. 
Um, so basically what that means is you could have a tantalum MnO2 capacitor, it's rated 40 volts, but you have to derate it by 50%. So effectively you're only going to have 20 volts out of it. Um, so for higher voltages, probably tantalum MnO2 aren't gonna be the best fit for you, but the poly tantalum polymers um, aren't quite that drastic. Voltage derating on the polymer is only like 20%, 10 to 20%, just depending on um, the voltage that you're using. And then, like I mentioned briefly, uh, you do use these uh, surface mount power inductors on the output as well. Uh, so Kemet has two basic types, metal composites and ferrites. Uh, metal composite, their benefit seems to be their softer saturation. Uh, they do have some drawbacks though, such as core losses. They tend to be a bit more drastic than in the ferrite. Um, and they're good up to around 40, 40 amps. Ferrites, a uh, bit more robust as far as how much current they can handle up to 70. They don't have um, as poor core loss as the metal composites do, but they do have a much harder saturation. So it's, again, it's a give and take. Um, so just a quick example sorry, of an input filter. So on the left, we can see where we've used some, or where we haven't used any uh, filter caps and our ripple voltage there is 2.78 volts. Whereas if you take use of the of filtering caps, we've worked it down to 0.7, uh, 0.46 volts on the right-hand side. And um, so big overview picture before we close out of the whole power distribution network where we're using both the decoupling caps and the filtering caps on the inputs and outputs. So you can see that power supplies are usually used for um, different or can be used for um, multiple DC to DC converters. So you need to take care to, um, I guess, balance that properly and keep, just keep in mind the things that we've noted, such as the lower ESR, lower impedance, just to help this whole system perform most efficiently. Um, and again, put them on the inputs and the outputs. We try to keep them as close to the converter as possible. Uh, just to reduce um, any effect that the ESR impedance could have along the path. Um, so some key take takeaways, I think we're almost out of time. We'll go through them quickly. Uh, so these are just kind of the high points that we want to leave you with um, that we discussed. So decoupling filtering, they're not the same. Uh, we saw that um, it's either giving something up or passing something along. Um, optimized decoupling can require cascading mixed capacitor and values in parallel. Uh, we saw that we can bring our impedance down a lot quicker when we use uh, different capacitance values together instead of just paralleling all the same value. Um, and we also saw some of the benefits to different capacitor technologies as far as if we want high capacitance uh, for lower frequencies, uh, lower cap capacitance for the higher ones, some of the differences between the ceramics and benefits that you might get out of them. Uh, also, the location of where the cascading um, decoupling capacitors are placed in respect to the load becomes critical as the target impedance frequency increases. Um, so we want to keep them as close as possible. Uh, application requirements dictate uh, filtering component selection. We saw how that brings down the ripple voltage. Uh, the power distribution system requires both decoupling and filtering capacitors and inductors. Uh, we saw that there at the end. And ESR and impedance is very important when sizing the capacitor bank, just for efficiency. And that is the end. I think we have maybe one minute left. Yeah, we do, Olivia. Thank you, and came in, came in right on time. Um, so while perhaps any other questions come through, the first one that actually came through was, is it possible to send this presentation? Yeah, we'll be sending a copy of this presentation out to uh, to all the registrants of this webinar. So if you happen to know anybody that registered for it but couldn't attend, uh, let them know that they'll still get this this presentation. Um, Olivia, just one question to perhaps clarify things a little bit. Um, earlier in the part when you were talking about decoupling, uh, you mentioned you know, if you have a target impedance to hit, then it's important to hit that that target impedance. But can you elaborate a little bit on 
what happens if you don't decouple properly? Um, sure. So if you don't decouple properly, like if you don't get your impedance down below like what your target is, which um, just keep in mind that's the impedance of whatever your load is, your, your IC there, um, it'll uh, greatly reduce the efficiency of the whole system. So you'll end up having to use like a lot more capacitance. It can get become kind of bulky, um, just not as efficient. And it, again, it could, it could even drive up cost, I guess. You'll be using a bigger capacitance bank. Um, so I guess the main thing, or one of the main things to keep in mind is just efficiency and reducing the amount of chips that you need to use, um, you know, things like that. Okay. Thanks. Um, and I think that's it. That's all the, the questions that came through and, you know, we're, we're right at just a minute over time. So with that, um, thank you, uh, Olivia, for putting this all together. I think this is interesting. You'll be receiving a copy of this presentation and um, don't forget to fill out that quick survey at the end of this so that we can uh, you know, take that and improve this whole process as we, as we do more of these webinars. So thank you, Olivia, and thank you, everyone. All right, thank you.